Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. Uh, this time I'd open up the uh, meeting for the uh, February 21st National County Board of Commissioners meeting. It is customary for our board to begin each meeting with a prayer by a sitting commissioner. During that time, you're welcome to uh, stand and join us, or you're welcome to use it for your own prayer, or you can certainly use it for a moment of silence, whichever suits your uh, needs for the day. And then we would have a pledge of allegiance to the flag uh, by Commissioner Wayne Outlaw. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to call on Commissioner Marvin Arrington to uh, do our invocation. Mr. Arrington. All right. Let us pray. To God from whom all blessings flow. We come here today to ask your continued blessing as we go about the business of Nash County Board of Commissioners business. We want to thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon this body and the citizens of Nash County. And we ask your forgiveness for all the things that have not appeared or been in your favor. But we ask your guidance, dear God, in your hand and the spirit of love and the spirit of understanding each other, that we might move forward and make good decisions that will totally make Nash County, one Nash County, one Nash County that will be beneficial with the same opportunities for all our citizens. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Did you join us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, commissioners. We're now on item number four, and uh, I will turn it over to our county manager. And of course, the primary focus of this meeting today will be uh, the beginning process for our 22-23 uh, physical year. And uh, at this time, uh, I will turn it over to the manager. Good Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you for allowing me to schedule this initial budget uh, session with you all. I just want to set the expectations for today. We won't be discussing a lot of figures today. I wanted to use this opportunity to share um, information with you. Uh, we'll start with the budget process and the budget calendar so that you will know the schedule that the county staff are on for completing the budget process. I'll give you some highlights on some of the larger capital projects that we're working on uh, currently. I've asked Mr. Rogers to come today to provide an update on one of the larger budget discussions that we've been having concerning the potential shift adjustment for emergency medical services. I've also asked Ms. Amy Pridgen Hamlet to come and share some information with you. She has come to me to share some challenges that she's having with staffing, as well as um, some additional mandates that have been put on the staff in her department. Uh, Mr. Kirkland is just gonna provide you with a brief update on our salary study and the timeline for getting those results back. And then I will finish uh, with sharing uh, with you what I feel like are some of our priority areas for moving forward. And you can give me some feedback um, on that information. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay. Then we will start with the budget process. And I, yes, I have help. Um, so the process is performed over several months, generally beginning in January by county staff. Per North Carolina state law, the county manager acts as the budget officer for the county and is required to submit a recommended budget together with a budget message to the board of commissioners and the public prior to June 1st of each calendar year. <clears throat> In addition, not earlier than 10 days after the day the budget is presented, the board and not 
to the board, I'm sorry, and not later than July 1, the governing board shall adopt a budget ordinance for the mandated fiscal year, which runs July 1 to June 30th. The budget calendar is the primary communication tool in the process of the preparation of the annual budget. The budget calendar provides projected dates and items that must be completed to meet the mandatory budget adoption as set and closely regulated by the state of North Carolina Local Government Budget and Fiscal Control Act. So the calendar um, lists primary tasks to be performed and the date by which Nash County plans to complete each task to meet the mandatory, mandatory budget adoption timeline. As you will see today, we are having an initial budget planning session, um, budget discussion really. Um, on March 23rd and 24th, we will hold the annual budget retreat for the Board of Commissioners. On May 3rd, we will meet with Nash County Public Schools and Nash Community College to hear their budget presentations in a joint meeting. On May 23rd, we'll have a presentation uh, by the manager for the recommended budget. June 6th will be when we have our public hearing on the recommended budget. And June 20th will be the adoption of the budget. Some additional key dates for the calendar. January 11th was when we sent information out to our management team to kick off the budget process. January 31st, we ask that all capital requests be submitted. February 23rd, requests for new staff and reclassifications are due from Human Resources to our Finance Office. Also on February 23rd, outside, um, outside agencies um, are to have their funding request applications in. March 3rd is our departmental uh, budget uh, requests completed by each individual departments will have those requests keyed by March 3rd. The week of the 7th through the 11th, I will meet along with um, our budget team with each of the departments to discuss their budget requests. And March 8th is when the fire district budgets are due. Are there any questions about the budget process or budget calendar? Have the fire districts already been notified of that due date? I believe so, yes. Would you mind backing up to that first calendar for just a moment? Yes. If you just hold up there a minute, I don't need anything other than, we don't have this in our possession yet, do we? You do not, but I will provide you with all of these slides after today's meeting. Okay, that's fine, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, all right, if there are no more questions, I'll move on to our capital projects update. So the first one is at the detention center um, and demolition has been completed on the linear cells in the north and south block for phase one work and site demolition work for the jail addition. Uh, they have begun work in the building crawl space to relocate existing utilities and to install new conduit runs. They've coordinated with Duke Progress and other utility providers to relocate the overhead utilities along Drake and Elm Streets. Work has been completed uh, to relocate existing emergency generator and ground transformer for power supply to the jail, the sheriff's office, and courthouse. And the steel has been ordered for the jail addition. Upcoming work on the detention center jail, we call it <laughs> several things, um, is to complete the site preparation and begin the work on the foundation and footings for the addition, to install additional footings and foundation to support the floor in the existing building based on the proposed renovations, to install a new grease trap and reroute utilities based on the approved site plan, and to construct a retaining wall between uh, access to the loading dock and the proposed jail addition. <coughs> the next capital project is an update on the Red Oak Elementary School. <coughs> um, to date, uh, the erection of the main structure of the pre-engineered building is 99% complete. Roofing at the 500 wing is 95% complete. 
Roofing on the 400 wing is 80% complete. The gym windows have arrived and masonry walls are being erected on 600 and 300 wings along with electrical and plumbing rough-ins. In the next 30 days, masonry in the 600 wing will be completed. Exterior block walls in kitchen and cafeteria will be in progress. Drywall framing will be in progress at the exterior walls and interior walls of the 400 wing. New roofing for the gym will be in progress and the gym windows will be installed. For the Northern Nash Field House, construction drawings will be completed by next week. They will advertise either the last week in February or first week in March and receive bids the end of March or the first week in April. Are there any questions about the capital projects? When you give the handouts for all these slides, will you add something that would give us the timeline, the projected timeline for completion of these projects? Of each one of these projects? Yes, yes sir. Any other questions? If not, I will turn it over to Scott Rogers for the emergency medical services shift adjustment update. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are we all? Good. So uh, my purpose today, um, if you remember, I was with you the first of the month and kind of gave you an overview of our staffing and where we were as it relates to code and so forth. Today I'd like to drill down just a little deeper um, and share with you some, some issues that we are facing in regards to our shift. Um, and something that has been talked about for, for a period of time, but I wanted to just kind of give you my uh, take on it, kind of taking us from where we are to, uh, to where a, a proposed concept would be. So what I'd like to do is just start out uh, by looking at our current um, structure that we currently have in EMS uh, and bring your attention to the three colors at the bottom, the red, green, and blue. And these uh, colors each represent a shift. So one of those shifts is working each day. And on those shifts is um, about 25 people that are serving the county throughout uh, the area. Uh, and of course we have their three shifts, which means that they are currently working a 24 on 24 uh, off shift. One of the things that we probably should have done uh, some years ago is to change that shift simply because of the call volume increases and the number of calls that they're running now. This shift was developed primarily for the fire service back many years ago when call volume was low and as you'll see in a few minutes, it was certainly or is certainly by far the most uh, economic way of covering 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's very expensive to make a change at this point, and I certainly recognize that, uh, but I would say that maybe the good news, if there is a silver lining here, is that, the, that, that we have saved uh, money uh, up, and up to the point that we do make a change uh, by continuing to work the, the 24 on, 24 off, which has not, not been good for employees. Um, so the three shifts that you see, the 25 people that are assigned are distributed amongst the county. Um, we have uh, on, on a given day, we have four QRVs, one of those being the uh, shift um, supervisor, if you will, the other being a shift, um, uh, excuse me, a district uh, supervisor that, that manages the southern part of the county. And then of course, we have um, We have 11, oh, I'm sorry, 10 ambulances uh, throughout the county along with the QRV in Castalia and a QRV at the hospital campus that is the uh, community uh, medic as you know. You know, uh, as I was discussing with you at the beginning of the month, 
Um, we, we do have some, or have experienced some sh staff shortages due to COVID and, and other things. I just wanted to show you that if we have someone missing from a shift, then the first move we make typically is to take down Medic 3, which is in the Castalia area. If we have two people out, then we drop Medic 8, which is the community medic. Um, if we have to go past that, we take out um, Medic 2, which is one of the supervisor's positions down at um, uh, Mount Pleasant. If we have another out, depending upon outages on any given day, EMS 4, which is the ambulance at uh, Mount Pleasant, is the first ambulance that we take out. But we would leave Medic 2 in place on any day that we have to take out um, EMS 4. So one of the things is we, we are still capable and, and have been very fortunate to maintain a nine point, average a 9.47 minute response time throughout the county with the units staged in the areas that they are currently staged. However, if you were to look at our 90th percentile of response, you would see that it's up to about 15.29. The issue with that is that's a little bit of a false number because we do have calls that require more than one truck. And when I say that, uh, for example, a cardiac arrest would require two ambulances and a, super, or, and a QRV. So that second truck responding on the initial alarm is coming from further away. So that sort of dilutes your 90th percentile. But the first unit on the scene is still averaging 9.47 seconds, so uh, nine minutes and 47 seconds. So uh, we're, we're still uh, doing very good there with time. The next slide, just to, it, just to demonstrate to you, if you look at how these calls are broken out by day of the week, there is virtually no, no significant change from day to day. Uh, all the days are pretty much consistent. The next slide, however, though, if you look at this, uh, is a calls by hour of the day. And what you see is that if you start out our day at 7 a.m., which is when we change shifts, uh, it's a little, little slower early in the morning. As the morning continues on, it ramps up to about 11 o'clock in the day being one of our busiest times. And then starts a slow descent again after lunch back down to somewhere in the neighborhood of midnight to 1 or 2 in the morning. It slows back down again until 7 the next morning. The issue with that is when we're working 24-hour shifts and 24 hours off like we are currently now, um, it, it doesn't really take but one call during the middle of the night that by the time they respond to the call, transport to the hospital, release care to the hospital, and return to their quarters, uh, especially if they're having to do decon for COVID or if they have to go to wake med or something of that nature, the night sleep is pretty much shot at that particular point. Um, so you still see a significant decrease in call volume at nighttime. However, it's unfortunately not what it used to be as far as um, how slow it is at night. The next slide here shows you a, um, a number of calls by unit or by ambulance. This, this particular, the last 12 month period that we have looked at uh, is 27,793 calls. That's a 17% a increase just over 2021. If you look at 2020 numbers, I'm sorry, if you look at 2021 numbers versus 2020 numbers. So what you'll notice here, if you look at the two that are circled in red, those are EMS 7 and EMS 8. Those are the two that are located within the city limits of Rocky Mount and obviously run uh, the, the majority, the, the largest number of calls rather. EMS 7 and 8 are both averaging around 10 calls a day, but sometimes as many as 20 per day, which in, in a 24-hour period, 20 calls is just um, a, a considerable amount of calls. Next, you'll see that 9 and 6, uh, well, excuse me, actually 5 is next, which also runs into the city. Uh, coming from the Westmount Station, if, if the two units in the city are busy, then that means 5 is going into the city as well. Next is nine uh, from, from Battleboro and six from Red Oak. They are uh, pretty much uh, identical in numbers. Uh, they too are second in units to the city of, of Rocky Mount. Next you'll see is MS2, which covers Nashville, and then the MS1, MS10, uh, 11, 
and four, of course, or county stations out where the call volume is not quite uh, as great. So again, if you sort of extrapolate that information and you look at the current um, calendar that our people work, if you remember back to one of my first slides it, with, the, with the blue, red, and green, let's just take blue, for example. Blue is, uh, is Jamie Moss's shift. So if you look at this calendar, on the fifth of this month would be their first day working. They would work Monday, be off Tuesday, work Wednesday, be off Thursday, work Friday, and then start a four-day period. There's a couple of things significant about that. One is, is that especially when we have folks to call out or sick or vacation or whatever the case may be, if you notice again, Jamie would work on Monday, but he can't fill in on Tuesday because he's got to work again Wednesday. And he can't fill in on Thursday because he's got to work again Friday and, and so forth. So really the only time that he can come back or, or his shift can come back and help us with fill in is during their four day break. So it puts us to where we're, we're working people a whole lot or we're trying to use part time, which is, is really very, very difficult for us to find. So, so um, this, is the, this is the current shift that we work. And, and just being quite honest with you, uh, we, we're going to have to change this at some point. It, it may not be during my tenure, but, but at some point we've got to make this change for two, two distinct reasons. And one of those, of course, is to be able to continue to staff our operation. And the second, of course, is safety and quality for our employees and for the citizens of, of the county. So on this next slide uh, is a, a snippet of a survey that I did with our employees uh, shortly after I was promoted. And what you see is I ask them uh, if they were assigned in the EMS division, what was the preferred shift that they would like to work? And what you see is that seven of them said 24-24 like we're working now. Um, 38 of them said a 24-72 shift, which is what I would propose. And then three of them said a 12-hour shift. That was out of a total of um, 48 total <coughs> respondents to my um, survey. So the, the one thing um, that is, is really significant, I think, from this set of data is the, the lack of employees that are interested in working the 12-hour shifts. Uh, they prefer to stay with the 24 uh, or 2472. The bad news about that is, is that they really don't have to work the 12 if they don't want to. If you look at our contiguous counties, the only county, of course, is Wake. And if you look at the number of calls they run, uh, then that is re, uh, a significant difference in us. So I guess my point to you is, is that when we look at the competitive job market for the people that we're trying to hire, they can certainly find a 2472 not far from here uh, if, if uh, they don't want to work the 12s. So if you look at my next slide, uh, this is just kind of a comparison of the um, counties that are around us. You, you do see Wake at the bottom uh, with, uh, they have a 12 hour shift. They pay overtime over 40 hours, but what you notice is that they run 109,000 calls a year. So quite honestly, for a metropolitan area like that, 12 hours is really the only choice that, that they have. The other thing I would point out to you is to, to notice that um, Nash and Wilson are the only two uh, counties up here that still use a fluctuating work week, which means that we pay half time for overtime. The major difference you see in Nash and Wilson is that Wilson works a 2472, which is 2184 hours per year versus the 2912, which is what we work. And in, a, in addition to that, we, we run a tremendous amount more calls than they do. This 23,000 is not our current number. However, I didn't update it because I wanted to keep it consistent with the other county data that I have. I don't have new data for those other counties. Uh, so the current challenges uh, that, that we're up against, of course, safety is number one. Uh, COVID, which I, I'm hoping that COVID won't be with us forever, to be sure it can't be. Uh, but the, the safety of our employees with the number of hours they work and only a, a, tw a 24 hour downtime in between each shift, I just think is calling, causing cumulative fatigue, which uh, concerns me greatly with vehicle operations and violent calls and, and of course just, just simply 
their ability to treat uh, their patients at, a, at the highest level of, of, of treatment as possible. As far as recruitment is concerned, our shift uh, really forces us to accept inexperienced applicants. Anytime that we lose someone now, we are basically hiring an EMT to replace them, whether they were a medic or whatever. And the reason is, again, is because folks are, are medics are able to go to other counties, work many less hours, and, and make the same amount of money. One of the other things that has affected our recruitment process is also the fact that for years and years and years, just like fire departments, we were able to recruit volunteers from, from volunteer EMS and rescue squad. And quite frankly, they just don't exist anywhere in the state anymore. So there's not a volunteer pool to pull from. So we're hiring younger people, we're hiring inexperienced people, uh, and if they do have any experience, then unfortunately they end up in another county. And then, of course, retention. We, we, we just simply are losing people to other counties, not based on pay, but based on number of hours worked and the, and the shift that they're able to work. So in this next slide uh, is the proposed change. Rather than working, and, and if I might jump ahead and I'll, I'll attempt to come back, but rather than working one day on, one day off, one day on, one day off, this works um, 24 or one day on and three days off. So again, if you follow the blue shift, which is Jamie's in, in our case, would, he would work on Thursday, be off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, work Monday, be off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, work Friday. So he works every three, he's off for three days and works one day. Again, in that three-day period, not only gives him a time to recoup if they didn't sleep at all that night before he got off, but also gives him time if he would like to come back and work part, uh, not part-time, but overtime or call back or whatever, he has the option to do that and not have to be back at work the very next day. So uh, the, the main thing here, though, is just simply the, the rest time, the recuperation time of being on shift uh, at the station. So if I might back up, the way that you have to accomplish that is by rather than having three shifts, you have four shifts, okay? So what it would require would be the addition of, of a D shift or a uh, yellow shift in this particular case. That yellow shift would take an additional amount of people to, to, to fill that. One of the other issues that I'd like to point out to you is that uh, over the, the years, uh, we have, our, our system has grown from, from what many of you know it used to be in the early 90s to what it is today. And uh, we have, uh, again, typically 75 to, to 80 certified positions. And if you look at the top in the light blue, uh, Scott Struffy, Dale Griffin, and Shamika, our administrative assistant, are the only ones of those people that are not assigned to a truck to answer calls daily. So my point being is that we have a very, very, very lean administrative support staff to those field providers that are out working. That has not changed for quite a long time. Uh, so one of the things that I think uh, and, and is, is critical if, if we want to make a move and have an operation that will be sustainable, I believe that we have to take the opportunity to add uh, three other or, or a few other positions at the same time. And that being, if you look at Dale's position, he, he's titled as a program manager and a, has always been responsible to ensure training and compliance and certification of all of our field providers. Since COVID hit, we have basically moved him to an operations position that is in the field managing the crews during the day to make sure that everything runs efficiently. Uh, again, I know that COVID won't be here, ever, be here forever, but nonetheless remember that on one particular day, Lee is the highest ranking officer, if you will, that is in the field. But tomorrow he'll be gone, he'll be at home. So uh, Dale is the consistent field person um, that is, is looking after the operation. So uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to add an additional training officer. We need somebody that works 40 hours a week to ensure that all of these people, we're, we're adding a tremendous amount of people to our staff if we do this, that have got to be trained, certified, compliance has got to be maintained and so forth. 
So after you pass Dale's position, like I was saying during the day, there is a shift supervisor, but he is assigned to a, a, a response vehicle. He responds to calls like everyone else. We do have a district chief that is too assigned to a response vehicle, but works in the southern part of the county because of the distance between the, the supervisor being in the Nashville Rocky Mount area just quite simply can't function in the south end of the county at the same time. What we're lacking is that level of supervision in the busiest part of the county, which is in the city of Rocky Mount, in the north, the Red Oak, Battleboro, Whitaker's, Rocky Mount area. So it, it is in my professional opinion that in order to be sustainable, we have got to add an additional district chief on each shift. That would be two, two district chiefs. One would cover, again, the north end. One would continue to cover the south end. Remember, in addition to making sure that an ambulance gets to every call in a timely manner every day, these district chiefs and battalion chiefs are doing, uh, you know, uh, performance appraisals. They're doing um, disciplinary actions. One is responsible for nothing but ensuring that the shift calendar is filled every day. Uh, and so we have a lot of administrative work that has to be done in the field on a daily basis. So I, just my professional opinion, if we want to do it effectively, this is, is the way that we would have to do it. This is the way the shift would look. We, we looked at that a while ago. My last few slides are just a few, few considerations that I wanted to share with you. One is that in order to do this requires 30 additional people uh, in order to fill that shift and, and to, um, to fill it the, the way that we should. Uh, of course, uh, four of those, five, technically five of those positions would be in order to support us with staff positions that we have been very, very short with for, for many years. The total cost of this for a year would be 1.8 million. Um, if we chose to, to implement it mid-year, mm -hmm. would be uh, 945,000. One thing that I thought in, in order to be transparent that I would share is that we could consider reassigning our convalescent staff. There's uh, actually, I put 10, but there's actually eight full-time equivalent positions uh, there that of course are handling non-emergent convalescent calls during the day. If we chose to um, allow all that to be done by franchise operators, then we could absorb those eight FTEs into the, the transition. Um, the other thing I'd like to, to, to say to you is that the process of hiring and training 30 more people is going to be a, a tremendous undertaking. Quite frankly, one that I would maybe like to be gone before that has to happen. But nonetheless, I believe it to be the right thing to do and um, am, am certainly willing to, to take on that challenge. But. Um, Again, I would like for you to understand that, that I fully understand this is a very, very expensive project, but one that I feel necessary for the continued positive operation of our, our uh, EMS organization, uh, and that's, that's why I'm bringing it to you. So I guess entertain questions. Any questions, of Scott? I have a tremendous amount of questions, but I really don't think this is the place we will probably need to schedule a work session to go through that. But okay. any other commissioner have uh, questions yeah, on I this? Do. Mr. Belfield? Um, have you taken in consideration, I was listening at the shift in the amount of time a person, 24 hours with no sleep, have you looked at it from a health standpoint for every person need sleep um, all the information I'm reading anywhere from seven to nine hours in a 24-hour period yes uh, have, have you looked at it from that standpoint and uh, what are some of the results of not getting enough sleep <clears throat> well I, I think that's the number one reason that brings me here today and that I feel so strongly about this this uh, need is that the uh, again when this shift was developed years ago it was a wonderful money saver when they had the opportunity to sleep most of the night mm -hmm. and occasionally you'd have a time when you didn't get to sleep you know every night of your three shift rotation but you still got rest 
and it, it just isn't there anymore. And there's a, unfortunately a lot of data that demonstrates that that fatigue is is dangerous. Mm. Yeah, and performing their work, they they do need rest. Yes, sir. to be alert. Mm. Yes. Uh, Another question you mentioned about average response time. What is, do you have any data on across the state? What's the average response time? I, you, I know you mentioned Nash counties. I, I do uh, have actually. Fall, you know, I brought with me um, just some national averages. Um, in a in a suburban area, the uh, the the mean uh, average time would be like 7.7. .7 with a 90th percentile around um, 14. If you look at a rural area, which I, I would assume that we're somewhere in between the two, uh, the 90th percentile can be as high as 26 minutes uh, with, an, with a mean of 14.3. So we, we are still um, able, fortunately, and I think it has to do a lot with the fact that we have very uh, strategic located resources but in order to maintain that, there are many times at night when one of these slower stations that I showed you don't necessarily have a call in the middle of the night, but are required to relocate to an area because there's a couple of trucks in that area that are busy. So we want to move one closer in case there's that next call. So unfortunately, it's somewhat of a ferocious circle, but we're, I, I think our people are doing great in maintaining those response times. Other questions, comments? I, I just go ahead, David. No, no, go ahead. I just one question, I'm, and I, I'm like kind of like the chairman. I, it's a lot of information, and I need to digest it all. But if you if you got a problem with fatigue in 24 hours, and then three days off, right? Don't you still have a problem with fatigue the 24 hours that you work, and the potential for safety concerns which you have? so strongly stressed? I, I think you do have a, a, some, yes. Uh, I think that leads you to the situation of 12-hour shifts is the optimum. But in eastern North Carolina, until this, the, the service itself decides that that's going to make that change statewide, we, we couldn't fill the seats. We just no way. I mean, out of all the employees we have right now, three of them are interested in working 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And if we make that change now, um, I just don't believe we'd be able to run every truck every day. I, I just don't think that. Um, eventually, that will be the solution. What? The 12 hour shifts. Okay. Fortunate enough, if you go to four shifts like I'm demonstrating, you can do 12 hour shifts for no additional cost. You have enough people to do it. I agree with that. If, if you can retain enough people to do it. Well, I just wonder when, when the 12-hour shift, you had only had one of your employees that expressed any interest in the 12-hour shifting, but my view of a 12-hour shift is three on, four off this week, next week four on, three off. Is that kind of what you're thinking? It would I mean, that's the concept we worked under at Abbott. Sure. Yeah. Uh, one one of always the- always had a problem with working people beyond 15, 16 hours uh -huh. because of that safety right. consideration. It doesn't take but one major incident. Another question, the fire departments, the, some of the fire <clears throat> departments have hired staff. Do those people, any of those people, I know they're first responders, do they have the expertise to, to handle some of these situations that you're going out on, particularly on the weekends? They get a call. They, 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 they go out, right? Yes. Yeah. They would. They would respond um, with with our crew in the event of a, a what we call an emergent call or or code three call. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they certainly don't have the training to administer uh, medications and and perform the um, some of the the life saving techniques that the paramedics. I do. didn't really know what that relationship looked like. What their capabilities were versus. I know it's not what it is in the EMS department. Right, yeah. They, they for the most part, uh, and, and of course, you know, some of them that are working in, <clears throat> in fire stations have a, an advanced certification uh, of EMT or, or even some paramedic, very, very few, but some paramedic. But they don't have the equipment nor <clears throat> the, uh, the proper training to do everything that an EMS unit would do. Sometime back we talked about uh, 
decontamination of the trucks, uh -huh. and we talked about the corrosion, et cetera, from that decontamination, and I think you folks were going to look at uh, some type of system, ultraviolet or uh -huh. whatever that might facilitate that process, make it less of a problem. Is that something that you've been able to do? Or? We have. We have changed the process. Of course, when we first started out, we were using bleach because that was the, right. the best option, and that did cause a lot of corrosion. But we have some new techniques now that are much less um, harsh on, on the equipment. Okay. Um, and and look, fortunate, uh, we, we've, you know, dropped down on the number of decons we're having to do per day. Yeah. And, and we have actually been fortunate enough to replace some of the hardware that was damaged on our trucks from the initial bleach applications. If, if you were working on the, on the trucks yourself, if you had to go back, and I know you don't, but <laughs> if you did, which, which would you prefer? 12 or 24. I mean, you just said mm -hmm. that. You just said that eventually it's going to be 12. Mm -hmm. So if we went to 24, then eventually we're going to have to change to 12. It sounds like. Yep. So which would you prefer? I know you'll mm -hmm. be very open and honest with. I, I will be honest, and 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 I would say that I'm probably not a good one to answer that because I, I, when I did work 24-hour shifts, I absolutely hated it, but I did it in a time where call volume was extremely slow in the fire station and about six o'clock every afternoon I was stir crazy having to stay there 24 hours. But again, it's a totally different world today in that they don't have any time to be stir crazy. Um, so that's a difficult one to answer. I, I think I might be too old to work 24 anymore, but um, I, that's what I would want to do if, I mean, I wouldn't want to work 12. Not, and, and what they do with 12-hour shifts, you, if you look at our staff, we have about 30% that don't live in Nash County. They travel here, and they can come here nine days a month to work the 24-hour shift rather than coming daily for a 12-hour shift. Um, it, it is a cultural change in the EMS business to go to, um, to a 12-hour shift in an area like ours. Now, again, in a in a metropolitan area, you, you don't have a lot of choice. But uh, here, it's it's in eastern North Carolina. It's going to be tough. I just got two more questions. Okay, I'll let you go. You said you had lost 25 people since 2019. Did, what what were the reasons for those losses? Do you well, have that documented or it, was well, it due I, to the shifting or. I think some of it is yes. I mean, the you ability. You have that information. About I don't have it in front of me. We could but we could qualify it. it for you, sure. Can um, you provide the handouts. Can you provide that information? Sure. Why those people left? And and can you also tell us for the past? I don't want to make it more difficult than it needs to be, but two or three years, how many people you've hired from these surrounding counties okay. that uh, work this 24-hour shift? See if how many have come from those areas to us from those counties. I just want to try to get a feel for what we're losing versus what we're gaining. I got you. And last thing I want to ask you, you said that uh, Wake County had over 100,000 calls annually and they could only work a 12-hour shift. Just for information, why is that? Just because they got trucks running 25 and 30 calls a day. Couldn't they work 24? Mm -mm, not run that many calls. Okay because they just spent, you know, after 12 hours. Under the current 24-hour setup that you've got, do you ever have to provide relief to those crews because the call volume is so so much in one day? I would sure like to, but I don't have an option have, to do that. You don't have to do that? Mm. Okay. Not able to do that? No. Mm. Okay. Be because, again, I've got one crew working today. If I call... B shift in, they got to work tomorrow, mm -hmm. so that don't help anything. And then the other shift would be on their on their four day break, and and I might could get them back, but what what do you think is the break point on that that volume where you got to go twelve? And then the second part of it, so for full transparency, what does the projection look like? Have you projected out for ten years, five years, ten years? what Nash County's calls might look like as far as the number. You're 23 plus today, so is that going to be 25 in a year, 26, 7, 30, 40, 50? What's it going to be? And at what point is it very important 
that you move away from 24 because the activity is so great, mm -hmm. like you said, that you've got to have the 12. Right. Um, I, when I said that I think it would eventually be 12, I say that because I think it will be regulatory. As far as... By the state. Yes, sir. As far as predicting call volume in EMS is, is awful difficult because you have all the same things that you do in fire, such as development and, and housetops and all that kind of stuff. But you've got all the data for the last 10 years. I, I do, but then when you have a COVID throat in there, it's, it's so much of an outlier that I don't know that we could do a reasonable prediction. We could give it a try, but if there's an, another pandemic or something like that, you know, for, for what I mean is, is the pandemic didn't change the fire department response numbers a great deal, but EMS, it just turned them upside down. So we could attempt to do a long range prediction, but I, I would certainly warn that's what it would be, would be a prediction. You could look at it and just exclude COVID from March of 20 to say March of 22, something like that. We could. That should give you a pretty good indicator of right. what the volume, the trend that it was showing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we could develop a trend, I, th I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dan. Give me I, I was just gonna say, I think you've done a good job of presenting us with what you have. We, and, and the expertise you have, this is not the first time we've heard this, and, and we know that change has got to come. And I, I appreciate your expertise, and, you know, we were told this oh, over a year ago. Now we're hearing the same thing. You've, had, you've done another survey with your employees. What's, what's better for y'all? And, and I appreciate your professionalism and knowing what to do to try to fix the problem. And... Uh, I just appreciate you. Well, I appreciate that. I would have much preferred not to have inherited this, but <laughs> nonetheless, I'll, I'll do my best I can. Mark? Yeah. Well, to get me to understand the 12 hour and the 24 hour shift, mm -hmm. I guess explain the culture of the 24 hour shift versus the 12 hour shift. And basically, what I mean are you know, the Employee expectations are the same. Are they allowed, uh, yes, sleep time, or how is that the, the, the culture? In a 24-hour shift currently like we have now, we do allow them to sleep. And when they can get rest in the evening time, that's, we certainly encourage that. If we were to go to a 12-hour shift, then there is no sleep time. You would expect day shift to be up all day and night shift to be up all day. Uh, again, um, the, the culture piece, I think, um, I, I hope I addressed that first part, but the cultural piece is just quite simply uh, uh, probably 90% of these people that work in EMS for us today have never worked anything other than a 24-hour shift. They've never worked a, an eight-hour shift. They've never worked a 12-hour shift. They're accustomed to the 24, which means that they work somewhere around nine days a month, 10 days a month. Um, they have adopted a lifestyle that revolves around that. They're away from home every other night. They're, that's what they like. They don't have to work as many days. They work more hours, but they don't have to work as many days. Um, and I, I would love to wave a magic wand and they would all be 12 because I would sleep better. But I, I just think it's my obligation to tell you that I don't think I can do that with the current workforce. Okay. Well, I understand. <clears throat> Excuse me, the latter part, you know, I guess the culture at work, and that is uh, probably, I don't know whether the response time for a 12 hour shift versus a 24 hour shift is any different, or how is that, <clears throat> how are you structured as far as, like say, you give a certain amount of time for rest or sleep? Well, they're, they're encouraged to rest, but if they're first due on a call, they got to get up immediately and take it. I mean, there's no downtime, so to speak, uh, as far as when they're, when, when they come in at seven in the morning, they are primarily responsible for their territory until seven <clears throat> the next morning. So anyway, I guess the thing is, as long as it's structured so that they are alert and ready when the call come in, uh -huh. that it's not a culture of, you know, like uh, uh, create 
that's just part time or not not being uh, ready for the job. No, I, I don't think with a 12 hour shift, you would see a huge difference in response okay. times. Now, I, I, obviously, if it's a call at two o'clock in the morning, and they're in the bed sleep, that takes another few seconds to get ready. But we have a, a we have a 90, 90 second what we call turnout time from the time they get the call until the time their wheels are rolling. And we we that is an expectation 24 seven. OK, that that is a structure. OK, uh, OK. All right. Thank you. I guess we'll get a copy of the handouts. Sure. Okay, thanks. You can give them to me. Got just a couple of comments, uh, and I, I would like to reserve majority of my questions for a more in-depth work on this. But the one thing I'm interested in, in looking at this 24, and then get the three days off. I'm interested if those employees that favor that are willing to consider signing a. Uh, or understanding or at least agreeing not to work additional 24 hour shifts in between those shifts uh, <clears throat> to get, because if they do that somewhere else, I don't see where we've gained anything. Did I make myself clear? Very, very much so. I, I, I hear you loud and clear. Okay. Okay. The, the issue is, is I think is that they're doing it everywhere else in all these other counties. So are they going to sign? Probably not. And my question is going to be, of course, and I don't want a response today, is what have we done? I mean, what have we improved if they're going to take that time and go work another 24-hour shifts in between our shifts? I think we've gained nothing. The other thing I'm interested in in our last conversation on this, you and I spoke about it, I do want us to look in the transition of this to see if there are some of our stations, whether it's one, whether it's two, whether it's three, that we need to go ahead to 20 to 12 hour shifts and have a hybrid of it. Uh, those stations in Rocky Mountain, it looked like you had two. Those two would out. be my, my right. That, that maybe we need to consider 12 hour shifts for those and maybe we can uh, be able to man those with those that, and of course I know you can't man them with three people. You said you had three people that would do that, but right. certainly <coughs> that's just something we ought to look at. Absolutely. Uh, I agree. Uh, but I'm very concerned that really all we are doing is probably going to end up with our people working more rather than less than what we are attempting to achieve here because they're going to fill in that shift on that middle day uh, many times. So do we, some do we, some homework on I, that and let us know I, what I the will. facts are. I, I would tell you this is that currently and for the last as long as I can remember, we do have a policy in place that they're not supposed to work past 11 o'clock anywhere, even at Walmart, the day before they come to shift. And I would assume that that policy would stay in place going forward. Um, well, well, it could stay in, mm -hmm. in, in place. Sure. I mean, that wouldn't hurt what I really see is going to happen. Right. Which in that three-day off, they're going to fill in another 24-hour shift in one of these other, in, in some other capacity. Well, and, and because we're all looking help so bad. Oh, absolutely. But the the beauty part I think would be is that maybe rather than doing that twenty four hour shift in that four day in that three day break in Northampton County, they would do it in Nash County. So we we could backfill when we have sick and vacation and all that. That right now I don't have anybody. But but you hadn't solved. The real reason you're bringing this to us is, is, is I think not it's, any better. It, it may not. Well, it, I believe it's better. It may not be solved, but the only way to solve it, as I've said before, is to overstaff all them shifts. Right. And and just the cost of that is yep. maybe the cost benefit is not what I think it should be. And hey, don't get me wrong. I'm willing to listen this thing out to the very end. But when we're going to spend two million bucks, we need to get it right. Uh, and, and that's my major concern. Uh, and. Dan, did you have another comment? Well, I, he said in his in his statement here that with with the shift change, mm -hmm. he he got more days in there that you can call a man back to work overtime when you're short, and you go always be short. Is that is that a, oh, I, I a false statement? That. So he, if he's calling our people back, mm -hmm. why are they going somewhere else? You know, I'm we not, got. I'm not worried about where they're working it at. Well, I'm just saying we're not going to reduce the fatigue because they're still working that middle day. But a man that uh, can't take it, now me and you, you, you know, we can we can work more than that. And we'd be glad, glad to come back and work overtime if that was our job. 
you speaking for yourself, sir. I'm speaking for you too, because you do it all day and all night. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just understand that point. And the next point you made was, did you would you have with this with these four shifts, you got enough staff that you'd be flexible if you need to do twelve at Rocky Mountain. You can let some people work that way. Is, is that it? Would take yes. Okay. It would allow us some flexibility. Okay. Oh. Uh, any other comments for commissioners? Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Stacy, do you have anything to say? Do I just go to item seven? You can go on to item seven. Okay. All right. Amy? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hope you're doing well. I hope you're going to explain to us what you emailed us. I hope I can explain it too. <laughs> I will say that it is um, a lot of things that cross over, so it kind of makes it difficult. And um, I'll have to admit I'm not well known for my coordination skills, so I'll go ahead and let you know that with the um, PowerPoint. Never noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I know how to use it. Um, basically, the first slide just kind of goes over our mission statement for our agency. But first, I would like to say I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this information with you um, to keep you informed of our agency's challenges. Um, as you know, the Department of Social Services is responsible for administering mandated programs to our citizens that comply with federal, state, and county mandates. Our agency's programs and services are provided to a vulnerable population of people who have very specific needs and who often, in crisis situations, expect that their needs are met immediately. Sometimes we have to provide mandated services to people um, that aren't interested in receiving our services, and a lot of times those are in child protective services cases and adult protective services cases. Our agency is charged with balancing limited resources against rapidly changing and increasing demands and needs. I'll say when I began um, my career in Nash County as a foster care social worker in 1996, I really didn't know a lot about the programs that our agency offered. I certainly never thought that I would have the opportunity to serve as director and be responsible for so many people's needs. If there's one thing that I've learned over the past 26 years in my employment with the Department of Social Services, it would be that the one thing constant in this world is change. Change is inevitable because things in life just never remain the same. Things change, people change, laws change, policies change, and if you work with DSS, even if laws and policies don't change, their interpretation changes. So that always brings another impact. These changes directly impact an agency that already has to constantly balance limited resources and meet demands. Um, I would like to share just a timeline of, an, of unexpected events and challenges that I've been able to see just in my tenure here with Nash County. During my first year of employment, it was 1996, there was the initial devastation by Hurricane Fran. Then in 1999, there was Dennis followed by Floyd um, and I think that happened, if I remember, the same month we moved into this county building. Mm -hmm. Floyd was simply catastrophic to many Nash County families, as you already know, the impact and struggles that um, families went on, and some, some are still suffering. Um, as many families continued to struggle for years to come, in, uh, to come in effort to recuperate from Floyd, then the 2008 recession occurred and again significantly impacted the number of families in need of assistance. Between July 8, 2008 and June 2013, statewide food and nutrition cases increased by 75 percent and Medicaid cases increased by 25 percent. In 2008, our agency had approximately 165 employees and we still had numerous frozen positions until 2016. There's a lot of other changes that have um, occurred as well. In April 2012, NCFAST, which stands for um, North Carolina Families Accessing Services Through Technology, that's our case management and 
system, it was implemented. First, it was, um, well, the, the reason was it was introduced as an online method for submitting applications through the internet. Implementation occurred in 2012 in food nutrition and then in 2013 for Medicaid. NCFAST meant new technology, which although it wrought advantages, unfortunately it didn't reduce the need or number of caseworkers that were required. More changes. In 2013, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act added more duties to our county Medicaid caseloads, and since then the Affordable Care Act requirements have continued to add county workload responsibilities. The most recent implementation of Medicaid managed care has created additional responsibilities for workers and with the possibility of Medicaid expansion, if it's implemented, then caseload sizes and duties will further increase. In July of 2016, the USDA began to hold states to a rigid standards for, pro um, excuse me, for processing timely food and nutrition applications. So 95% of all applications and recertifications had to be processed timely and now also accurately. Over the past few years, our agency has had a significant increase in the number of audits across programs. Um, as you read in the Board of Commissioners update we generally provide, um, and I think Mr. Davis was able to participate most recently, we had our um, recipient eligibility determination audit. The number of audits that we have have significantly increased, and a lot of the um, penalties, if we're not accurate, end up being county paybacks. Right now, we're on an accuracy improvement plan. <clears throat> okay. As you know, our agency, like most organizations across the state, has had excessive vacancies. One of our former direct DSS directors always taught us that when the pig is in the ditch, we all have to work together to pull them out. Um, our agency has done just that. We've worked together and made efforts to use staff from all across our agency to fill voids where possible and to meet our mandates. We've worked diligently to think outside the box to fill positions and to get work completed to meet the needs of our citizens. <coughs> our county manager, both currently and previously, as well as Mr. Hill, have been extremely supportive of our creative ideas and efforts to address vacancies and in an attempt to increase employee morale. When I mentioned earlier about how change is constant, I would have to say that programs are far more complex than ever before. I began my employment during a time when our Child Protective Services intake form was, was front and back, and now it's 17 pages of questions that have to be completed just at intake. The same has occurred with our economic benefits pro benefit programs, which include food, nutrition, and Medicaid. You'll be able to see in the next few slides that these programs are very much specialized and it now takes a considerable amount of time to develop program knowledge to actually be prepared to manage a full caseload. Unfortunately, if we were able to fill every vacancy in this agency tomorrow, we still have many challenges to overcome because of the caseload sizes, because of unmanageable supervisor to staff ratios and some other factors. Nash County currently serves approximately 19,000 food and nutrition recipients and 30,000 Medicaid recipients. And I'm not going to read all the information on the slides because I know you can read it and I'm going to touch on several things as I, as I go along. Um, you will note that the chart, and I can't see it very well from here, but it reflects the case increases in just the last three years within our um, Family and Children's Medicaid. In um, 2019, we had um, 10,500 cases, and that's just households. That's not total number of recipients, but that's just households. And then in January of 2022, we had 12,893, and we currently have 13 recertification workers. So when you divide that, that ends up being about 991 cases per worker in that area. In addition, with food and nutrition, we currently um, have 9,889 households and with 10 research workers, I think that was up from 7,022 as you can see, so that puts um, an average of about 988 cases per worker. Our adult Medicaid, um, we have long-term care and then we have, we have numerous programs but the two largest would be long-term care and our private living arrangement. Um, long-term care is very complex we have um, 6,360 cases in our adult Medicaid unit right now, 
and 5,061 of those are private living arrangement, and that puts eight research worker, recertification workers with approximately 632 cases apiece. And we have 1,299 long-term care cases, and that would typically be about 433 cases per worker, but we currently have two vacancies in that area, so we have one worker and other workers working across the agency um, in, in jobs they were promoted to to still try to cover to get, to get our needs met. And I'm not really even factoring in all the um, impact of COVID. Um, it would be simple if the change was just in numbers, but that's not the issue. The change in numbers is accompanied by more and more additional responsibilities added to our staff, which makes caseload sizes impossible to manage, and it creates more vacancies, because even if all vacancies were filled, workers can't effectively manage caseloads because a lot of the workers that we've now hired are inexperienced. Um, I don't know if I can... And then we have um, more changes. Um, effective the end of 2021, we had, um, we're required to have certifications in our NCFAST. So that's under section law um, 2017-57. So now caseworkers using the NCFAST system to input or make eligibility determinations for state programs have to be certified. Um, that means they pretty much, if they, if they fail, they have to um, take it again, and they only have 90 days to be able to complete that. So um, that, that makes it more challenging as well. And not only are they required just in the initial certification, but then they have to have special certifications in the program for which they work, whether it's Medicaid, food nutrition, um, whether it's energy, whatever program they're in, they have to pass those certifications. And then to go on and actually learn the actual programs. So that's just taking additional time. Um, some of the continued challenges that the agency faces with NCFAST implementation include, due to federal regulations, applicants are required, aren't required to complete and verify information at the time they submit an application. So once they submit an application, if all the information is not there, it can't determine eligibility until all that information is input. So workers are having to spend a lot of time contacting the individuals and trying to obtain the information they need to even be able to, to process cases. As with new te technology, there are defects that must be corrected and waiting for help desk, desk tickets. Sometimes that is time consuming and we also recognize that NCFAST has the same challenges with filling vacancies that our agency has as well. Um, NCFAST is internet based, so it isn't always readily available 24 7 a day. Um, sometimes there's internet lags, and um, I think the county's even experienced internet lags in the last um, little while. But the impact on our workers is that NCFAST is only available certain hours, so if it's down while the workers are here, then they're not able to meet their um, workload requirements. It's just one more um, barrier. The other piece would be is, and I think I've mentioned it before, our non-merit-based staff are prohibited from performing food, nutrition, or Medicaid benefits eligibility, um, and that's based on federal rules. And so I think the difference to point out there is, is in the past, we were able to hire individuals from temporary agencies, and now that's not legally, that's not, um, it's not legal. We're not able to do that because of the security. Um, and then I think I, I talked earlier about our supervisor ratio right now is, is currently not manageable. And our, some supervisors have uh, one supervisor to 21 workers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on because I want to talk about their increased responsibilities and how that's impacted our hiring and being able to um, even fill vacancies. Um, and again, not only have caseload sizes increased, but as I explained a few moments ago, the programs are becoming even more complex with frequently changing policies. Many programs have online policies that are obsolete, 
So many agencies are having to develop their own training teams to ensure that the staff are trained sufficiently to implement these programs and av avoid county paybacks and making sure that our, we're determining eligibility correctly. And that's difficult when we already have a limited amount of staff. Um, the state acknowledges that they lack the resources to update the policies. We know it's um, in the works and that they have the same hiring issues that the counties are having. Um, but at the same time, we're responsible for making sure that, that, it, that it happens. So while our agency understands that the state lacks, lacks resources, we have to process our cases timely. And for any audit findings, that if we don't have prompt guidance that we request from the state, then we don't make the right decisions and, and that's, that penalizes us later. Um, again, changing laws and policies also leads to an increase in applications and that will sometimes result in additional duties, additional required training um, and, and increases in our caseload sizes. Not only that, the expansion of programs, programs and services also increases our call volume. And I know we get complaints on, um, on calls, I'll say, often. Um, a lot of times people want to talk to a person and they want the answer right then. And a lot now, I'll say with COVID, workers are having to take applications on the phone so they're not readily available to just talk to someone and people will literally just call, call, call until they talk to a person. Um, and that might not be the person that can actually assist them. Um, then we have some policies that impact numerous programs within the agency. And right now we have two that um, will impact both our adult Medicaid and the number of guardianship cases that we have, as well as the number of special assistance in-home cases that we have. Um, I'll go on to say our adult services has also been impacted significantly because um, they have eliminated the special assistance waiting list. We had a cap of 25 and right now um, we, we've been told that there's no longer a cap and so we don't have the <coughs> social work staff required to be able to manage the influx of cases that's anticipated as a result of this change. In addition, um, we continue to see an increase in the number of adult wards with significant mental health issues. I know I've talked about that in the past. Um, more and more of these guardianship cases include young adults in their mid-20s to mid-50s with serious mental health, medical issues, and cognitive limitations that often requires medication and a lot of other services, often even placement. Um, several aren't compliant in their medications and um, it's very difficult for, for you to obtain services for them when they're not even compliant. That does create an additional challenge to our staff to be able to manage these individuals and to be able to access services for those individuals. Um, our worker, well, we only have one guardianship worker, um, so she's spending an extreme amount of time on cases and um, I guess what I've just said is an example of a change because our current guardianship population used to, it was older individuals living in, in facilities with cognitive um, ailments and now they're having to work more with um, younger population that um, actually lives much longer as well. Um, in addition, our Adult Protective Services reports have quadrupled over the past few years and we're having to file more petitions for guardianship in these cases. Many of these individuals do not receive Medicaid and they don't qualify for Medicaid due to their income. Our staff, again, are working a lot to um, put services in place for these individuals, a lot of times trying to keep them in their home, but we don't have the manpower to spend but so much time with each individual person in their home. It's very time consuming. The cost of necessary resources replacement um, becomes the, the cost and responsibility of our county. And so our workers work really hard to try to keep them in the home, but at times um, that's not possible. And I think since January, or from July to January, we've spent about $15,000 um, providing for placement to meet that extra need. Um, and, and that's not significant, but it's, it's a way from what it used to be. Um, 
Again, we only have one guardianship social worker and the state recommended caseload size is 25. So the worker is already at capacity and I know we have at least four, maybe five pending hearings, hearings scheduled. Okay. Um, we also have, um, and I'll go into it more when we talk about supervision, but currently in our adult services, a lot of our staff in adult services, the social workers are new. Our, our supervisor has less than, um, I don't think she's even been here to, not quite two years. So right now she's even carrying a caseload. So you have new social workers and then you have a, a supervisor who's having to carry cases um, in order to meet that need. Um, our deputy director and myself quite often spend a lot of time with our adult services and with our child protective services staffing cases um, because of the complexity of the cases. We also involve a lot of times our attorney but because of the needs of the adults and being the appointed guardian, they're requiring more and more hearings for us to attend, um, more and more um, constantly making decisions for adults. Um, it's, it's just a lot more people that we are responsible for and um, staffing is, is, is imperative, is critical in those areas. Um, let's see. Try. Looks like I skipped something. Hmm. I apologize. I don't think it's in the order that I thought it was. Okay. I'll just go ahead to um, staff development at this time. did warn you that I have no coordination. Okay. Um, with administration, I apologize. As I indicated earlier, our supervisors have too many staff assigned to them to be able to provide the necessary support and guidance that inexperienced staff need. Um, the increase in audits has required a significant amount of time in supervi for supervisors. They have to spend a lot of time not only in the audit preparations, but having to participate in the audits, in the audit reviews. Then we have to follow up with a lot of consultant contacts. And then if we're put on a program improvement plan, then the process kind of starts all over and we just continue to have. So um, in addition, personnel issues and other duties such as reviewing and approving workers' timesheets and day mm -hmm. sheets. Um, it, it's very time consuming. They also are having to um, carry caseloads or help pitch in and, and make sure that cases are processed timely so they're doing casework as well. And that often limits the time available they have to interview and actually fill vacancies promptly. Um, okay, staff development. Um, we currently have three staff that are responsible for training all of our economic benefits programs as well as our NC FAST training agency-wide for and that's for new and ongoing requirements. So um, we have three workers that are responsible for providing policy in those various areas as well. As I've said several times, we have a lot of new and inexperienced workers, so it's extremely difficult for three staff to train across all programs as well as assist with second party reviews which are required um, by the state for our quality assurance. As we found in uh, one of our most recent audits, worker errors are the primary issue for a lot of the findings and it's because they're not taking the time to be able to go over the work because they have so many cases that they're responsible for processing. Um, The next few slides will involve staff challenges um, and I think a lot of them we may already know um, but they've been ongoing challenges and there's so many factors kind of intertwined that it, it, it's kind of difficult to, to even process. High turnover, lack of seasoned staff, 
need for additional trainings due to increased complex, complexity, ugh, can't even say the word, of programs. We need that we have a need for adequate staff to manage caseloads so that data integrity is not compromised and, and to be able to reduce the staff levels, stress levels of staff and actually to impact and improve our morale. Continued changes without additional resources will result in continued a vicious cycle of vacancies and turnover and inexperienced staff with un unmanageable workloads. We have um, had a lot of, and the, I don't think our chart shows it very well, um, we've had a lot of um, workers just with stress call in. Um, we've had a lot of leave without pay, which creates a lot more work for us, it creates a lot more work for HR, it creates a lot of work for finance, um, and, and it's just never ending. Um, there, there's a lot of change in being able to hire individuals as far as the work culture goes. Um, we have had staff use EAP and the county provides that as a great benefit. Um, and it is helpful a lot of times for supervisors to be able to refer staff, whether they have organization issues, um, time management, or even just personal things. Our staff have lives, and sometimes their lives come to work with them just like any other human. Um, so we do have a lot of excessive unpaid leave. Uh, we have FMLA, so all these little things that also factor in, in our challenges. Um, Reasons for position vacancies, um, and I can't see it very well from here, but our largest would be resignations. Um, we do have staff leave for other agencies. We have staff relocate to other states. We have staff who don't want to do income maintenance. It's not what they wanted it to be. And, um, and that's across the board, not just for um, income maintenance, it's just for our positions, period. So. Um, I would say that, and this is just my personal opinion, I don't think it's the pay in Nash County. I think that we do well in comparison to a lot of counties. Um, unfortunately, we have fewer positions, so when some counties have 180 to 200 and you have 998, it's just it's less stress if, you're, if you don't have to contend with that much um, responsibility. And so um, we do struggle to fill our vacancies and, um, and, and I, even with internal promotions, we're unable to fully release staff because we can't release them to their new position until we fill their other position. And so we have staff kind of sort of one foot here trying to learn their, their new position while they're meanwhile still helping in the other position. So that's been a barrier as well. Um, Okay, and this, this slide basically um, shows our, our adult Medicaid and their training experience. As you can see in the chart, um, we do have a lot of inexperienced workers. Most of our current employees are very much still in the process of training. Um, in training less than one year, um, you can see, and then we have in intermediate trained, which is like one to three years, and then seasoned in adult Medicaid will be three or more years. Um, even in supervision, a lot of our staff, we have I think three supervisors that have been there for 18 years or more, but um, most of our supervisors are intermediate um, less than two years, in training less than two years, or intermediate, which is like two to four years. So. And then with family and children's um, and food nutrition, you can see the numbers. Well, no, you can't if I don't change it. You can see the, how the numbers change there. So we have a lot of staff that are in training and not very many that have um, a lot of experience. We have had an ongoing lack of applicants with re related experience. We've had to hire um, inexperienced staff just kind of go back and look at what we could do and try to pretty much um, train from within. And sometimes it's criminal records, sometimes it's just we don't get applicants. And I think we've tried various things, um, but unfortunately it's not just our county, it is, it is across many of the counties. Okay. Okay. Our workload has increased in size and it, was in, it has been impacted by COVID, but um, 
it has continued to increase in complexity prior to COVID. So we were already having issues um, with vacancies prior to COVID. Um, an increase in the number of audits that has definitely required more and more duties, more, more expectations. Okay. Um, you can see on the next few slides our agency's ongoing objectives. These ob objectives will be reflected in our upcoming budget request as we continue to seek resolutions to the challenges that I've just mentioned. I truly pre appreciate each of you for taking the time to hear our agency's needs. I know it's a lot of information and because there are so many factors interconnected, it makes it more challenging to present and even to resolve. Our agency has great staff that are charged with meeting the needs of many Nash County citizens. Um, these workers continue to face tremendous obstacles and changes that workers in the years before them have not experienced. 20 years ago, our agency had 167 positions and in 2022, we have 170 positions. As you can see, DSS has always been very mindful of the utilization of county resources. Um, we will continue to be conservative and creative, but with the additional changes that have yielded such a significant increase in responsibilities and potential paybacks, our workers are beyond stretched. Um, it's not easy to join together to pull the pig out of the ditch anymore because of the complexities of the programs and the requirements across the programs. We're fortunate that our agency is able to receive a lot of reimbursement that other departments don't have in their budgets. We very much recognize and appreciate your time and your ongoing support. And I can attempt to entertain any questions if you have any. I really think, Paul, Ms. Satchler, that, I mean, Amy has given us a mass amount of information here. Uh, I don't correlate what she's saying to budget, nor is there a direct request. I'm just really having trouble when I got stuff sent to me over the weekend or in the last week, I didn't understand it. And, and I really am less understanding now oh, no. that, than, than where I was before I came in here. But it, it was this done to show us where we are and there will be needs coming or what Correct. was the point of this presentation? Correct. Yes. Okay, so there is some request coming behind this then? Not yeah. today. I understand, not right. today. Right, yes, yes. Okay, all right. How much is this department, uh, as far as number of employees that it has, it seems like it's related to something to do with, with additional employees. But do we receive any directive from the state on that? Because do they not pay some portion of the salaries there, or, or how does that work? Oh, either one of you. They do. Yes, we usually get between 50 and 75 percent reimbursement. So when we hire or add a new position, it doesn't cost the county as much money. Um, but there is a partial partial payment from county anytime we have a position. But do you get guidance on how many positions you can have? No. Well, I'll take that back. Um, in child welfare, we have, and in adult <laughs> services, we have a mandated caseload sizes. But there's not any currently with economic benefits, and that's what presents the challenge. Um, our directors' association, we have been trying to get our state to look at that and to be able to give us guidance, but we don't have anything in stone. And if it's more people that you need, I always track vacancies uh, from year mm -hmm. to year in each department and you have always had the largest number of vacancies mm -hmm. and more more people to positions allotted does that help anything if you can't well, build the ones you got and I i'll say i had the same conversation with the director in pitt county before she recently before she just recently retired but mm -hmm. we had this conversation last year and the year before mm -hmm. and um i remember saying uh, her saying, I said, well, I said to her, there's no way our commissioners are going to give us new positions when we can't even fill what we have. And she said, well, if you kill the ones you got, you're never going to keep any to be able to fill them. So they were able to obtain, like, new, and they're much larger than our county, obviously, mm -hmm. um, were able to obtain to be able to reduce the caseload <clears throat> size to make it more manageable so that people wanted to stay instead of leaving. 
I don't know if that helps, but. I, I, I understood what you said. Uh, right, but I'm, so, but I'm more in, in not necessarily adding worker positions, but I would like to see our staff have the adequate supervision to ensure that they receive the hands-on, to ensure that um, they have the proper guidance mm -hmm. and training to be able to manage more than the average worker would be able to. And I think right now that's coming with us having to be able to provide our own training and we just don't have the staff to be able to fully train workers at the magnitude that we're having to hire new workers with no experience whatsoever. I think rather than me be too concerned about it today, I think we just need to wait for the ask to come. And that's fine. what specific it is. Oh, but I, other commissioners have any comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. I do want to ask, what is the staff to supervisor ratio? Do you have that? <clears throat> For what area? You, you just said staff to supervisor oh, ratio. Oh, um, in the areas that I'm referring to, it's mm -hmm. one to 21. So, or 21 staff to one supervisor. Okay, and, and you're saying that employees also take leave without pay. Is that in instances where they have exhausted their sick leave or FMLA vacation? They've used all that and so they're so stra strained that they're willing to take. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Other questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, I had one more. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. sorry. You, you called. I, well, I, w I was trying to get my thoughts together, but I <clears throat> wanted to ask. You, <clears throat> You said it's it's not so much as hard to keep people, but to get new ones. But yet, I thought you mentioned something about the salary. Would it not be more prudent to increase the salary to to get um, seasoned social workers or staff on board? I've seen those salaries, and they're not. And I'm not saying that our salaries wouldn't be benefit from being increased, but. I don't think that people always leave because of salaries. I think that having peace of mind at the end of the day um, makes a big difference. Okay. And sometimes we'll have staff that travel from afar to come to work here, and then when they find somewhere closer to home that makes just as much or close in money, then they then they leave. Thank you. I, I had numerous ones. You, you want to go ahead, Mr. Aaron? I'll just go down the line. <clears throat> What's the uh, state retention rate and Nash County's retention rate as far as keeping employees? I don't know what the state retention rate is. Okay. And right. you say your dominant reason for resignation is what? Um, I don't have one predominant, but it would be several. It would be relocation. <clears throat> it would be other positions. Um, I mean, some uh, of them were retirement. So. I know, but we got to kind of nail down one dominant reason. I think why people won't stay in the job like you have for 26 years or so. And uh, how we fix, try to help fix the problem. Mm -hmm. If it's not salary, if it's, you know. We, I mean, I'm not saying it's not partially salary. Yeah, I'm but, saying I think it's a combination of reasons. Uh, right, but I guess in my mind, we gotta kind of try to narrow it down to the, the three or four best five reasons, or are they solvable, that kind mm -hmm. of thing to identify. And, right, uh, and I think some of those would be employee morale. I think it would be that we lack the supervision to be able to provide the support that they need. I think that their caseload sizes impact. Um, right. You know, so I think it's right. based around all the things that I'm sharing with you today. Right. If it doesn't involve money, then <clears throat> it involves uh, some other things that well and staff do leave for money um, a lot of times I'm just saying that our county is pretty much in my opinion um, comparable or pays much better than a lot of the surrounding counties right so if that's okay intact then like I said we have some other issues that we got to discover and nail down mm -hmm. so that uh, our employees feel comfortable and want to uh, stay here and work uh, whether it's caseload or whether it's supervision, whatever that problem is, we we got to find that. Well, and, and, and I will say that workers have been working overtime in Medicaid for quite a while, and they are stretched and, <clears throat> and tired. So 
Yeah. That, that's another. Yeah, like I said, I'm sure it's not mm -hmm. one reason, but there has to be a top five or something okay. you know, to identify that, work on that. I think Mr. Ayrton feels the same way I do. We've got a lot of information here and what we generally are looking for, uh, Ms. Manager, is solutions to whatever the issue may be. So I guess that's coming as a second phase. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Ayrton, did you finish? Must I law? Well, I don't even know where to start, but uh, I want to piggyback a little bit on what uh, Mr. Arrington said. Do you not do, do we still not do exit surveys in Nash County? We do exit surveys with DSS and then I think the county does one as well. So if we do exit surveys, we know why people leave. Right. And I just named, I didn't narrow down the top five reasons I can go back and pull our exit interviews and well, be able to provide. the top reason is resignations. That's correct. That's 50 plus in three years. Yes. So why did they resign? That's, I, if you do exit surveys, you've got that information. Right, we do. And I didn't pull the top five reasons, but I can certainly pull those and um, give you. Sometimes people don't give a reason, I'll be honest. Okay, I yeah, and I understand that. Sometimes they're not. Well, and like I said, I, I, people relocate. They... Um, they do leave for more money. But I'd be interested in knowing from those exit surveys why the people are leaving, uh, specifically, particularly the uh, resignations. And just a couple of comments on some other things. Uh, I was going to ask you, wow, you must be working tremendous overtime, nights, weekends, et cetera. What is your annual overtime expenditure in DSS? Um, in relation, percentage-wise, in relation to your base salary, do you, do you have that number? Is it one percent, two, five, ten? I don't have the percent. How about weekends? Are you working weekends? I'm not advocating our staff, working weekends. Our staff are working some weekends. Yes. How about the? Well, I'm just talking in general, but you are working weekends. Right, and what we're finding, honestly, is when they're working well, and you. In eligibility, they can't always work every weekend because if NC Fast is shut down, they have you know they have a schedule where they do their um, corrections or defects or updates or whatever. Um, so we do have staff, but what I've seen is that a lot of times it ends up that they end up taking time, so it doesn't end up being comp time or paid overtime because they take some time during the week. That was kind of my next question, NC Fast. Do they have resources that they can make available to the counties if you have training issues, uh, et cetera? I know initially they did because mm -hmm. I had exposure to that through the individual that was coordinating that for the state. Do you, what communication are you having with the NC FAST people as far as providing that resource to you, or if it's available at all? Right. Um, our staff, we're, we have to go through a training for NC Fast, but there's no one from NC Fast that specifically gives us that training. But didn't didn't initially they provide help you with that training? Um, they may have. I was involved in that, so I know the answer to that question. They may have initially. Okay. But they don't. And you're saying they wouldn't provide that now? Not to my knowledge. Okay. No. Okay. I'm going to check on that because I do happen to know the individual that set that up for the state. That's hard. Wow, that's unbelievable, really. You, you said just a couple of general questions. You said we, we got 30,000 people in Nash County on Medicaid. It's so that's approximately. That's over 30% of our population. Okay. You said you couldn't hire temps no, because sir. of security reasons. Right. We're not allowed. You have to be a merit-based employee. Mm hmm or you can't enter NC Fast. The only employees we can allow in NC Fast would be our energy, and that's because it's not considered Medicaid or FNS, so it's not a, a federal program so to be able to. What would it take to, to, for you to be able to hire? I don't even know what it means, merit based. What does that mean? What would it It means take? they have to be employed by the county. Okay. Not a temporary worker through an agency. So you can't hire them from a temp agency like Pfizer and no, all, sir. All the industries do and no, sir. That's uh, been part of the issue, so. Okay. You indicated that when you take applications that if the paperwork is not filled out correctly, you cannot ask them to fill it out. You have to call them mm -hmm. after the fact. 
Why? Um, you said you couldn't do that. Why can't you do that? Well, because everyone doesn't bring an application in. They submit it electronically, fax, text, um, drop well, if, off. If they submit it electronically, you can respond electronically. You said you had to call them. You said they Well, they have in. to be able to make contact with the individual. So if somebody faxes something in, you would have to be able to contact them to be able to get the correct information. Okay, you said you had one guardianship worker, and I think you said you needed 25 or? No, sir. I said we currently have 25 cases, and that's the max per worker. Say, and that's for, for that one guardianship worker? Yes, sir. Okay. And you said that you don't really need people, I, I, I don't say this wrong, mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm, and I'm going back to my days at Abbott, so when we had a production line, we might have X number of people working on that line and we had a supervisor that managed that line and other lines. Is that what you're saying? We don't need more of the line workers per se. We need more of the supervisors to manage the lines. I would say we probably need both, but I think it would be more beneficial for us to have staff support with supervision so that they have more one-on-one -on -one and we can better ensure that they're trained and doing the things that they need to do to be productive. And you said it's one to 21. In um, two of our units, yes, sir. Well, what, what is it in total? Do you have that information? What, what is do it you... less or more than one to 21 or what? In other areas? Yeah. Um, in other areas, we have less than 21. And, and it varies across programs. Our child, child welfare workers, the staff ratio, I think, is one to five, one supervisor to five social workers. You mentioned Pitt County, but just in general, not necessarily Pitt, but how does that ratio compare to surrounding counties? Mm -hmm. um, I'll say the Do ratio... Do you have that exact information? Have you checked on that? I have. I've talked with several directors I've received or got several um, org charts. Yeah. A lot of counties have... Um, like program managers, then they have um, IMC income maintenance supervisor threes, then they have two income maintenance supervisor twos under them who then supervise like eight, eight workers or eight or ten workers. I think that's the kind of detail you're going to need to come back if you have a, if you have a ask for right. additional people. And we, we have, have but I was, it was my understanding that we just kind of let you know the problems today and then our resolutions will be provided kind of when we submit for budget. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, that, that'll do it for the day for me. Okay. Mr. <clears throat> you mentioned, um, I thought you said high rate of turnover, and you mentioned morale recruitment. Uh, going to the morale part of it, uh, are you saying that morale is not good or it's good? Um, I'll, I'll say when we completed our um, strategic plan, I think it was in 2016, morale was an issue. It's an issue that we continue to work on. So, um, this, so it's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, are you, you working on that now? I think we are. Um, I'll be honest with you. It's myself, our deputy director. We have two program managers, and we have a lot of vacant, a lot of supervisors um, mm -hmm. that aren't always there or FMLA, just different things. So we're doing the very best we can with the staff that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that other commissioners have asked you about is that going back to the morale. Uh, any of those contributing to it, you think? Well, morale? Yeah. Um, I do think that, um, I do think morale is low. I do think that workers are overwhelmed. I think that um, some staff have used every bit of leave that the county's provided as far as COVID, and then others have used none. Um, mm -hmm. They've worked really diligently. I, I can name very few that have been here um, to be able to follow through and help with the chaos that these past two years has brought. Um, it, it, it's been really tough. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think, you know, we appreciate everything the county has done um, for our staff. Um, but um, at the end of the day, we do various things to um, build and improve morale. And, um, and I don't want to say money wouldn't help. I'm certain that it would in some situations, you know, and in other situations, maybe not. Well, I know I have a relative that 
in fact, a niece that works in the Social Service Department in Durham County. They allow the employees to work from home. Now, I'm not, I haven't questioned her as to what <clears throat> phase of social service that, that <clears throat> some are allowed to work from home. Have you looked at that in, as, um, as a part of my help morale? <laughs> or uh, would you be, uh, would you take a look at that? Because <clears throat> I haven't heard you say anything about <clears throat> your employees working from home. Right. We have, um, we have had workers, some workers work from home. We don't have the equipment for all of our workers to be able to work from home because some of them are new. It's kind of difficult for them to be able to work from home. But we have been able to use that in several instances when we had season workers, whether we had folks out with um, FMLA or COVID or um, so we have really utilized the working from home. I've had situations where I had to bring people back because they weren't working from home. Um, and it's very frustrating because we don't have the, the oversight to be able to monitor every individual working from home. And I'm certainly not going to have somebody there if they're not doing what they need to do while other people are in the agency and suffering or struggling, rather. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I had... Oh. Uh, on on the uh, percentage of your social service department staff, how many of them are residents of Nash County? Do you have that information? If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, we but do I'm have a lot. I don't have it specifically. We do have a lot of staff that um, work work out of our county, though. Okay, I'm through. Would you repeat that answer if I didn't quite? Oh, I'm sorry. What you're um, I was saying that we do have a significant number of staff that do work from out of the county, or not from Nash County. Out of the They're county. not Nash yeah. County natives. Okay, no. thank you. Yeah. Sir, could I just get clarification on one final thing that I just yeah, absolutely. You said for head count, additional head count, that if it's mandated by the state. They don't give you some number that they'll pay for to handle that mandated requirement. Is that just how does that work? I um, thought I thought I thought when they give you a mandate, they give you money for X number of positions, kind of like a teacher in the school system. Right. Mm -hmm. they, they don't they don't just give them money. They mandate a number of positions and they just pay for those positions. Right. And they don't always mandate a number of positions, but they'll mandate is like the caseload size. In certain areas, but like they, in child welfare. Do they mandate the, the money? No, we just have to draw down whether it's 40 or state funds, or and each program would have a different reimbursement level. So you don't really, what you're saying is you don't know for your programs how many people you really need, or? I'm saying the state recommends it in some areas and not other areas. But whether they do or not, you are running the department. You know how many people you need. I have an idea of what we need, um, but I think it kind of, I don't know how to answer that very well, other than to say, if we had trained staff, then I think our numbers would not be, we wouldn't need as many staff. I'm not trying to significantly increase the number of our staff. I'm not going to come and ask for 20 new positions in income maintenance. Um, I would like to be able to gradually add and be able to work with what we have and see what works. Thank but you. I don't have a magic number to be able to yeah. say that. I got you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I can see one thing that in, in what you're saying, I think, is, is lack of supervisor experience do you, you you lose a lot of supervisors mm -hmm. that quit and go somewhere else? um we have well we have lost a few but most of ours we've actually lost to retirement okay well i'm just seeing it looks like to me in this chart i'm looking at supervisor experience 85 percent of you folks have been here less than four years supervisor in that role in that okay. in that role in that and, category okay so. in the supervisory role mm -hmm. some of them have been here um for a number of years, but. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you got that figure all over, they may just, I was just wondering if they are the ones that resigned and they just, 
you throw them out there and say, do the best you can, and within four years, they're gone. So. And, yeah. I mean, I'll just say, if you hadn't told me what department you were from, your scenario of what you said you face is identical to what the construction industry faces every day, too. That what now? I'm sorry. Construction industry faces the exact same problems you got with unqualified uh, supervision and all of our people are retiring and nobody's there to fill in the it gaps. So and it's not a Nash County I, problem. I, I do sympathize with you uh, in what you're doing, and I know it's not a Nash County problem. It's a problem everywhere. But, uh, it is, it is. We appreciate your support. I'll try to ask as I go through uh, to other areas about things like that, and everybody's got the same issues. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. <coughs> We'll move on to item number eight, uh, salary study update, and I call on Anson Kirkland. Like this one. Amy put us in a state of depression. I hope you pull us back out of it, sir. I hope so. <laughs> um, let's see if I can click this correctly. I didn't bring my readers, and so I'm liable to take us a little further than I need to on the slideshow. Um, I am here to provide you an update, a brief update on where we are so far as our pay study. Um, as you all are aware, we've been working with the Management Advisory Group, or MAG, um, on our pay study since back in November. As a part of that process, we've been um, providing data um, comprehensive data to the MAG group. Um, we've been giving um, employee names, titles, salary, years in position, hire date, and that kind of information. We've also provided electronic copies of each job classification, our salary table, our pay plan, and other information that they've requested um, from our department. We also provided a list of potential targeted <laughs> counties and entities for market comparison. Um, that was based on population, tax rate, and proximity to Nash County. And let me, I'll leave it right there. Since, uh, well, about the last four weeks, employees have been um, working on and completing their online job questionnaires, profile questionnaires. And I don't have the results, um, my update for today, but as of last Monday, nearly 500 out of the just over 600 employees had completed their um, profile, and I feel um, fairly confident that most all 600 have completed those by, by today. Um, after that, the supervisors were asked to go in and make comments on those profile questionnaires. Um, so I feel like we're on target with that. Um, there are, the MAG group did indicate, indicate that they needed a few more responses to have um, to fully have what they needed to do a comprehensive study. Um, and after I get my update from them today, I feel like it'll be, um, they'll provide the information that they've gotten what they need to continue on. Um, let's see. Went the wrong way with it. <coughs> well, it's a very sensitive little mouse. Okay. Um, MAG has been generating survey data for the last couple of weeks. Um, the counties that they've um, been including in that survey are Burke, Chatham, Cleveland, Craven, um, Craven Franklin, Harnett, Johnston, Person, Rockingham, and Sampson counties. And they will also um, include other counties that they feel would be appropriate. Um, they're just some of the preliminary counties that we, we had um, provided to them. That data is being consolidated and will be used to assist in establishing the proper grade levels for our positions um, within the scope of the PACE study. There we go. Um, 
They have communicated with me that they are on target for providing the preliminary estimates of a possible cost to implement a pay study um, by mid-March and then also a final set of recommendations by the end of March. So based on every um, communication that I've had with MAG, we're on target to have our um, pay study completed in a timely manner. Are there any questions? Questions for action on this item? Hanson, I noticed uh, the counties that you had, they all, with the exception of one, were in a western direction. Why do you think that is from Nash County? We were basing it, um, the county manager and I basically looked at the um, population, the tax rate, um, and that sort of thing initially. Uh, we, did, we did look at a few that were um, right next door to us, but we didn't want to limit it to those individuals. Um, I don't think there are any other things that we looked at other than the... When you say tax rate, do you consider a uh, total assessed value, which I think is very important? The county total assessed value of, of what revenues they've gotten? We did not look we, at that. We did not, okay. yeah. But you see the relationship between the two. The tax rate really does it. To me, that come into play near as much as total assessed value versus population would be. But think about that. I mean, I'm not here to change what you're doing. And we can certainly go back and incorporate that. Um, well, just ask the company if they okay. ever utilize that. Because, sure. you know, if you can't pay, you can't pay. I mean, correct, so correct. You can't do anybody, you can't do it. But if you can do better, you should do better. Correct. Any other questions? Other questions? Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. I am glad to hear your own schedule. Uh, I know the anticipation level for the employees is pretty high on this thing. Uh, yes, it is. And of course, uh, with budget season where we are, it seems like maybe it'll be of some value to us working through our budget. Yes, thank you. So that's what that gets us to item number nine. Which I Thank you are scheduled to sum it up. Yes. Good afternoon again. And before I go into um, item number nine, I did just want to say thank you for your attention and patience today. I do understand that a lot of information has come at you. I think it's important that we had uh, the representation of a number of employees that work for Nash County represented today, um, their work situation, what they face on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it was important to share that information with you prior to our budget retreat and starting to dig a little bit deeper to look at uh, what we need to do to address some of these issues. Um, so thank you for allowing us to present that information to you today. Um, the next section is functions of the budget and budget priorities. And I will ask you for your comments and input as we go through this. Um, the first one, and I'm going to have help. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, functions of the budget. Mm -hmm. So a budget allocates resources while setting and clarifying goals. It articulates the Board of Commissioners' ideas, strategies, and priorities for the upcoming year. It's a way to publicize the county's projections of revenues and expenditures for the year. It's a way to communicate to the citizens about how public money is being spent. And it provides the management team and the board of commissioners with a roadmap for monitoring the progress through the year. So these are budget, it says budget priorities. It's budget priorities as well as just focus areas um, that I think is the direction that we're going in here in Nash County. And I've got five listed here, and then the next five slides, I'll break those down. Uh, but again, I welcome your input and comments um, on this section here. Um, so employee compensation, retention, and succession planning, smart economic development, growth, and the new land use plan implement implementation, public health and safety safe operations, 
vibrant communities, and build healthy infrastructure and future capacity. So again, I'll break each one of those down. The first one being employee compensation, retention, and succession planning. So as you just heard, salary study, uh, we will be looking at the implementation of the salary study, how we can move forward with that, and in the future, purposeful salary management. And what I mean by that is thinking about how we can stay ahead of the, the curve when um, it seems like each time we have a, a salary study, we have built compression into our salary system, and we don't want to continue to do that. So uh, we want to look at purposeful salary management look, moving forward, and that may look like the potential of implementing a merit pay system. We did have one of those um, in the past, and we've uh, not used that system for a number of years. And I think that that has contributed to the compression issues that we face here in Nash County. So we'll be looking at that moving forward. Cultivate a team atmosphere with input from all levels of the organization. I've had an opportunity to meet with several of you and I get to meet with um, others of you uh, later this week to talk about uh, cultivating a team atmosphere um, here in Nash County where everyone feels like their voice is being heard. Build growth opportunities and succession planning. Uh, we need to continue to train our staff. Um, if they aren't able to take uh, advantage of training opportunities within their field, um, we need to provide those opportunities here. And we have our training program, Building Leaders Together. Uh, the training committee is going to meet next week and hopefully uh, look at um, launching that program again since we had to shut it off due to COVID. And policy review and benefit assessment. So we are continuing to look at our human resources policy manual as we work with our employees on a daily basis and see where tweaks and changes need to be made with our policies. And then also um, continuing to look at benefits um, and if there are any uh, additional benefits that Nash County needs to be offering to help with retention. Are there any questions about those? Am I on the right track with employee retention and succession planning being one of our priorities here in Nash County? I think so. Okay, cool. thank you. <laughs> Smart economic development growth and the new land use plan implementation. We want to continue to expand our shell building development. Um, we're looking at ways that we can do that and some of the additional funds that are coming to Nash County, if those can be used for shell building development. Establish the Economic um, Development Advisory Council. I know that's something that we've talked about for a couple of years and so hopefully um, moving forward we can get that established. The land use plan uh, work sessions, we need to have some work sessions once that plan is completed, work sessions with the board members so that we can um, do some knowledge building and you all are aware of the changes that have been made in our uh, land use plan and support workforce recovery efforts and I think you know, we're already doing that. We uh, were able to, um, Patsy was able to help us with um, a CDBG, a CDBG grant, or was it community development or community services? Community development block grant, CDBG grant, uh, where we um, created a partnership with NEW to be able to assist employees um, entering back into the, the workforce. So hopefully we can continue to work on those efforts here in Nash County. Are there any questions about anything in that section? Okay, public health and safety safe operations. Uh, so we are evaluating public safety work schedules. Uh, we heard from one area today and we have uh, spoke with staff from the sheriff's office in the past about some of their schedules and we will continue to evaluate those. Continued COVID-19 response, um, of course, supporting the health department and um, emergency management um, in those areas. 
our detention center expansion and future planning. There's obviously a lot of future planning that needs to take place uh, that, want that once that facility is, um, is finished and we need to staff it and, and be able to get it operational. The opioid settlement um, development of programs and services with the opioid settlement funds and then our safety and risk manager, uh, the new manager and doing employee education in that area. Are there any questions there? Okay. Vibrant communities, what I mean by that is um, our support to our Nash County Public School System and Community College, uh, support with our Recreation and Senior Services Department, We've talked about the agricultural community education effort to be able to um, push some education pieces out there for folks moving to Nash County and especially rural Nash County and what living in rural uh, areas looks like, as well as um, educating our citizens on the services that are offered by the county. Uh, we've had some conversations about awareness and education on our services in the past. Any questions there? And then build healthy infrastructure and future capacity. And what I mean by that is to support preventative maintenance activities, whether that's preventative maintenance on um, HVAC systems or roof repairs, um, structural repairs, things like that, our water and sewer expansion, um, the capital improvement plan for both the county and our school system, um, convenience site safety and expansion. We've had some conversations lately about safety at our convenience sites um, and then the future, um, potential future of an, an additional uh, convenience site and a space needs assessment. We have um, lots of areas um, in the county that are growing and we need to take a look at what we have, um, and what we need moving forward in the future and, and what that looks like, how be purposeful and make sure that as we maybe move departments around uh, that we're doing it in a purposeful way that we won't turn around two years later and need to move again. So um, that's what I mean by build healthy infrastructure and future capacity. Are there any questions? Are we in agreement that these are areas that we want to focus on in Nash County? I think for the time being, we would be in agreement. Okay. Is there anything that you all would like for me to put on my radar that's not already on my radar? As it relates to uh, budgeting? Areas of focus. Right. Good. Then that's all I have. I would just say, uh, and I think the board would agree with me as we move on into this budget, uh, let's be very mindful of our uh, percent of increase with revenue to last year, which is a little over 6% is what we found of reoccurring revenue. Don't know if it's sustainable or not, but I think we've made clear all along that this board generally didn't have any uh, appetite for uh, raising our tax rate so therefore if that remains the case of the board that we've got to work within revenue projections and seeing what we're looking at in the past which means somewhere in the five six percent range is what we are looking at that we've got to work with right. uh, for uh, increasing in budget and then, of course that's only if we can uh, come to our uh, minds that the revenue increase for this past year would be uh, moving forward in the years to come. Uh, we'd have to take it each one at a time. And of course that excludes any one-time funding because we are indeed getting a lot of money coming in at the present time, but we're doing our best to utilize that money for non-reoccurring expenses, which won't get us in trouble. A uh, few cases we have done a few little things that are reoccurring, but have been very minimal. And I think that's probably what this board would like to continue to do is when we get one-time funding is to utilize it for one-time expenditures. Uh, sometimes we get funding in and we actually 
scramble like we did some some last week in a couple of meetings trying to find that right sweet spot to spend it in knowing it's not going to be here again therefore you got to find something that it works on but uh, keep in mind uh, we do have revenue growth we are uh, lucky we do uh, many counties from this point in the state eastward do, do not have that luxury uh, that we have and of course I think as we have seen today there are some needs and we can match those needs up with the revenue projections. So hopefully it'll be a pretty good and a painless uh, budget season. But looking forward to getting into it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments from the board? Well, if I were going to <clears throat> talk about your capital project, if I were going to add anything on to it, uh, I would hope that the county would take a look at well to get involved in affordable housing. Counties are doing that across the nation now. And I just think maybe we ought to take a look at it. We, we do have <clears throat> municipalities in the counties that are doing it, and we have some that are not. And public-private partnership, I think, is a good way to go. Thank you, Mr. Belfield. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is uh, to call for a closed session. Uh, I would this time call for about a uh, five, six minute recess and then come back in the closed session if we could. And I'm trying to move it along because I do have a kind of important meeting at 430 on my MPO that I'd like to catch okay. you if I could. So uh, we stand recess for about five minutes. Thank you. We're now back in open session. Uh, there was no item uh, in economic development that required action that uh, needed to have a public vote on it at this time. Uh, and therefore, there will be no votes on anything that we got updated on in the closed session about economic development. Uh, any other items that need to be brought forward at this time? Do I need to say it again? You're welcome to, sir. <laughs> uh, I will be filing for re-election to the Nash County Board of Commission from the second district before the filing date is over. It'll probably be Thursday. All right. Most likely Thursday I'll be filing. Thank you, Mr. Bell, for good news. I appreciate it. You're making that decision. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Chairman, did you want to speak with board members about carpooling to the district meeting on Thursday, the 24th? I didn't want to leave that up to a, a staff function, if that's okay. Okay, we can I, do I that. did offer that I would be glad to drive, but okay. uh, ever, ever how y'all work it out, I will, I will be one of the drivers if you need me to be. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's fine. Y'all be in touch with them then. We will. All right. Is that this Thursday? That is this Thursday. Okay. Yeah, this, this coming Thursday. So you will be in the area, as you stated. <laughs> Anything else? I, I'll leave from my house, so if anybody wants to come that way, because it's just as close for me to go to Lewisburg as it is to go come to Nashville. So if all, anybody wants to ride with me, I'll what be glad to meet you on the I don't think I'm going to go to your house to go to Lewisburg. No, I don't think you would either, but <laughs> my interest might. But. What time do we need to leave, one of the commissioners asked? It starts at 530, right? Um... Probably 4.45, I think 4.45. Lewisburg is about 20. 45 minutes to get there. I mm. think it started at 5.30. They start feeding at Meet, meet at 4.30. Uh, Feed, we'll, 4.30. We'll meet here at 4.30 then. Okay. All right. I'll meet starts at 5.30, See right? if we need to change it. Correct. Anybody, is everybody, anybody know they're not going? Everybody going? That's wonderful. I'm going to leave from my home. I'm going to leave from the house. You're going to leave from the house, too. Yeah. Leave from the house. You're going to leave from the house. Well, from Wilson, anyway. From Wilson. Okay. I'm fixing to say. All right. <coughs> you leave from Wilson. So you, you, you just got uh, you four of us. Hmm? Or you will meet somebody in what county? I'm going to Okay. Are you going? Okay. 
and Patsy. Six of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Oh, I can carry six fine if somebody doesn't ride mine riding in the back, which is not too bad. Back. Okay. All right. Good. Anything else? Entertain a motion to close the uh, commissioner's meeting for the 21st. Moved by Commissioner Leggett. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Belfield. Any questions on that motion? All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by a light <clears throat> sign. Stand adjourned. <clears throat>